Oh, well, we have a very special treat for you this morning. Um, a number of years ago, Carol and I uh, went to Virginia Beach and started having a, uh, an annual conference down there. We do Catch the Fire in Virginia Beach, and we became very good friends with Pat Robertson and CBN, and then Gordon Robertson, Pat's son, who is now the head of that wonderful ministry. How many watch CBN? at home, all right. And I'm sure some of you got, you know, born again watching that program. Well, Gordon is in town for some meetings with his Canadian staff and, and let me know he was coming and so we asked him if he would uh, be willing to speak and he said he'd be delighted. And so this, I, I just want to give you a little background on this ministry. Uh, we have watched over all the years that we've been there, I think we've, we've done 13 or 14 conferences in Virginia Beach consecutively, but I was always amazed at the number of souls that they would win to the Lord. And it was like 39,000, uh, sorry, 39 million, 42 million, those kinds of numbers that just floated around 40 million. And in one time, I think we were with them on an outreach in the Philippines where Gordon unpacked all of this to his staff and we sat there with our mouths open learning that these are very, very solid, hard numbers with uh, decision cards pretty much to back up every single one of those decisions. How many think 40 million a year is pretty good fruit? Okay, well. Last, last year, they almost doubled it. They, they, they registered 79 million decisions for Jesus. And, um, you know, that's reason to love them all right there. But it goes much deeper than that because just over the, over the years, um, we just have fallen in love really with, with Pat and, and especially Gordon because of his heart for the kingdom and his heart for the Holy Spirit and his heart for the, for the power and the moving of God. And, you know, it's, it's just great to see a lawyer turned TV evangelist turned wonderful, wonderful friend and personality. Let's stand and give Gordon a great welcome to our platform this morning. Come on, Gordon. God bless you, my friend. You may be seated. I don't know if I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> For those of you not on social media, please congratulate John and Carol. Their very first great-grandbaby was born yesterday. So welcome Emily Arnott into the world. John and Carol have delayed their sacred pilgrimage of adoration to be with us this morning. But soon, when are you going? No, we haven't. You haven't planned. Planned. It wasn't planned. She wasn't planned. You didn't know about this nine months ago? (laughs) She wasn't planned this early. Okay. We thought it would be next week. All right. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't he? He took a lawyer and made him into an evangelist, which is a miracle. (laughs) And it all happened on the shores of the Gaddafi River in 1994, um, where I had been tricked into going on a mission trip. Uh, John Jimenez tricked me into doing that. He had a dream. And in the dream, I'm supposed to go with him to this mission trip. And at the time, I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. Uh, I was busy practicing law and trying to make a bunch of money and trying to live for me and nothing else. And uh, God got a hold of me in the middle of a Hindu festival, uh, which is just bizarre. But that is so God uh, to literally show me what people are doing around the world and just awaken me to how selfish I was that 
you know, I had this great gift of salvation, and that was all fine, and I had my hell, hell insurance, and okay, and every once in a while I'd go to church, and every once in a while I'd give money, and I was feeling pretty good about all that, but no, nah, I was really far away from him. I, I, I didn't know his heart. He was an idea to me. Uh, I'd had dramatic encounters growing up, but uh, saw the price of ministry, and I didn't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, I didn't want to pay a price. Uh, I wanted easy. And um, uh, it wasn't until I saw Jesus that I realized how great it could be if you just follow him with all of your heart. And you could have these great things. And the great news is that when he appeared to me, he didn't want to talk about any of the things that I had ever done wrong. He didn't have this big list. He wanted to talk about what we could do together. He wanted to talk about our future. He wanted to talk about the great things. He wanted to talk about the good stuff. And uh, boy, that's really nice. That is good news. Yay. Yay, God. Uh, I'm not here to talk, talk about my story, but maybe I'll get into it. Um, Thursday morning, I was in devotions, and um, God's leading me back into some uh, Greek studies, um, and I'm in the middle of the devotion, and uh, he speaks to me and says, John's going to invite you to speak at church on Sunday morning, and I went, okay, and he said, I want you to share on this, and I said, okay, and then that night, John texts me, will you speak? And then I waited a day and said, okay, I'll see. Um, so, so let me get into that. We got, uh, we got, we got a clock, so I got to move. Um, but it's just great being here. You, you guys got to know the angels are singing with you. The angels are singing with you this morning, and it's just absolutely glorious. You're in the presence. You're in with him. And just start realizing that. Start realizing the greatness of his power towards us who believe. Today I want to talk about changing your thinking and believing the good news. Which sounds really easy, doesn't it? I'm a recovering lawyer. I know how hard it is to change your thinking. Especially when you think you're right. Now meditate on that. I've gotten to a point where I call it the curse of intelligence, that we think we're right. And in that, we're missing God. We're missing the greatness that he has. And what he wants us to start thinking about is how big is possible. And we're so smart, we start thinking how impossible it is. And as a result, we lay down and die and we don't press into what he wants us to do. Because we start thinking of all the reasons it's not gonna happen. And we start thinking God has uniquely chosen us in 6,000 years of recorded biblical history that I am the first one he's gonna lie to. I'm the one. All the promises were good for all those other people but they're no good for me because I know they're not going to work for me. And we get stuck in these modes of thought. We get stuck in our material senses, and we get stuck in thinking our budget or our bank account is our God. We get stuck in thinking that this illness is going to be with me for all eternity. We start thinking bad thoughts. And then the worst is to start to attribute all of that bad to God that somehow or other this is God's will for me. And therefore, I need to patiently accept it and suffer on through, and it's going to be better in the sweet by and by. Okay? Anybody like me? Anybody think like me? I'm a sinner, and I need to get saved. I need my thoughts to change so that I can believe the good news. Let's turn to the Gospel of Mark if you have your Bibles or... You have your tablets or your phones or I'll put it up on the screen, but just to check maybe Bereans and make sure you search the scriptures. 
uh, and find out on your own because all of this is there. I love the Gospel of Mark. It is the Gospel of action. Uh, Christian tradition holds that uh, the Apostle Peter sat down with John Mark and, and dictated this Gospel. That it, Mark was the writer, but he was interviewing Peter. What, what did Peter experience? And therefore, it's this real bold gospel. It's this action gospel. And what I love about it, it doesn't spend a lot of time in the preliminaries. It gets right to it and right to it quick. You know, in the Gospel of John, you've got to go a couple of chapters. Luke spends forever trying to get to these messages. I mean, he went, it's, it's like this whole musical that you've got to go through first before you start hearing Jesus preach. Mark, very first chapter, this is the first sermon Jesus ever preached, okay? He's 30 years old, he's gone through the wilderness, he's been tempted, he's been baptized at the river, he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, he comes out of that experience and he says this, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And then he stopped. Isn't that great? Wouldn't it be great if all preachers today you just said that and you sat down? <laughs> or you started to demonstrate? Uh, maybe you're wishing I would do that right now. But I want to unpack this for you because there's a whole ton of meaning in here. Um, and, you know, it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the time it's fulfilled other than the time it's fulfilled. And, and you can bank on that. The time is now. It's not some far off time. Every promise, every prophecy can be fulfilled. All the promises of God are yes and amen now. Now, we await his second coming. We await the new Jerusalem. But all the promises of God are yours right now. And even more than that, he wants to reveal all truth to you. The time is fulfilled. There's no waiting line. You don't have to queue up. The kingdom of God is at hand. A lot to that, I think the simplest explanation for the kingdom of God is in the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Wherever you see God's will being done, that's the kingdom. If God's will is not being done, that's not the kingdom. Start thinking about heaven. Anybody sick? Anybody poor? Anybody lonely? Anybody unhappy? Anybody got the lamentations? No. That's God's will. That's his kingdom. And we're authorized to pray that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if God's will is already being done on earth, why are we being asked to pray for it? Why are we being asked to command it to come? that his kingdom would come, his will would be done, if his will were already being done. I'm not trying to get into Calvinism or predestination or any of those other wonderful things, other than to say the world is broken and we have been commissioned to fix it. We are his ambassadors to a lost and hurting world and we get to come to bring the good news. And when we come, we're to announce, he tells us in Luke chapter 10, announce this, the kingdom of God is at hand. Why? Because you're there. The kingdom is in you. And when you express the kingdom, when you express his will, his dominion takes over. Realize there's so much power in what you say, what you think, who you think you are that you're an ambassador of the king and you get to announce this, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. All right, done with that. Repent and believe the gospel. There are two main streams in Christianity, uh, all the essentially started in the first, second, and third century. One I'll call the Latin stream and the other I'll call the Greek stream. In the Latin stream, there was a guy named St. Jerome who translated the Bible into Latin, and they called it the Vulgate, and that became the official Bible of the church for, I think, all the way to Vatican II. Uh, it's been a long time. It's been around a long time. 
He took a Greek word, metanous, metaneo, and he translated it into Latin, penitere, which is where we get the English word um, penitentiary, and then where we get the English word repent. Um, and within the Greek, there is a sense of turning away from sin, turning away from your old thought pattern and going to a new thought pattern. There is that turning sense in metanous, but there's no penitentiary. You, you, you're not into prison with it. You don't have to do penance. Um, and unfortunately, in our, even in our English translation, when you read the word repent, um, you, you start feeling guilty, don't you? That have I repented enough? Have I turned enough? Have I done this enough? And, you know, and, and I, I just hate it when that creeps into our thought process uh, because who's the accuser of the brethren? It's not Jesus. And, and the reason I'm able to say that so confidently is when I met him, he didn't accuse me of a single sin. He, he didn't. It was all love. And it was that love that changed me. It was the goodness of God that led to my sorrow over how I had been living. And my desire to fulfill his plan and purpose is what changed my heart and said, I want that. I want that. It wasn't some guilt. It wasn't some penance I needed to do. It was, this is good news. Let's go after it. And let's go after it with everything we got. Um, so within the Latin world, um, the Bible and the official Bible had that word for penance. So essentially it got translated, do penance. And, and, and by the way, believe the good news. <laughs> um, and it's hard to believe all the things that God has for you when you're stuck feeling guilty for your sin. When you start thinking, God doesn't remember it, how does that change you? Where he's cast it away, he's completely wiped it out, he's justified you. When you stand before him, you stand as Jesus before him. What does that do? How does it change your thinking? So often in early days in ministry, and occasionally you can catch up with me today, where you go, boy, I wish I hadn't done that. And uh, boy, the enemy will beat you over the head with that. And you'll be trying to walk out into the miraculous, and you've got this, you know, how, how can you be preaching when you did that? Um, and well, I've got some stories on that one, but I won't, I won't pause. I want to press on. I want to complete the task for today. Um, let's get to the good news. The Greek, metanous. Change your mind. Change your thinking. Change how you approach your feelings. What is your purpose? What is your motivation? And when you get that right and get motivated by love, then you're able to believe the good news. The interesting thing here theologically is that this is both a gift and a task. All right? So you get that. The, the, Jesus, this is his sermon. Change your thinking and believe the good news. And he both enables us to do that. Faith is a gift. The, the change that comes from rebirth and regeneration is a gift. The heart change that happens when you're converted is a gift. But it's also incumbent upon us to keep thinking this way and to not to go back into the old method of thinking and continue to believe the good news. All right? I, I know I just gave you a whole bunch, but <laughs> I'm going to get into the medical here. Can an old dog learn new tricks? I'm now 57, I'm starting to get very set in my ways, and I, and I wonder about this. Um, 
And, I, and I'm reading all these things about how to keep your mind nimble, and one of the best things you can do is learn a new language, and so I tried to do that, and I was like, oh, well, no, this is hard. Um, and can you learn new tricks? And I want to give you a new word that uh, I learned about two years ago, neuroplasticity, where medical science is now proving that you can fundamentally rewire your brain that your brain is so miraculous that it can create new pathways for thoughts, for feelings, for sensation. It is possible because the inner workings of your mind are plastic. They can change. Here's a guy that started it, and he started his research back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Paul Bacciarita. He was born in Brooklyn, educated in Mexico then became the head of neuroscience in the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he had some very interesting case studies, one involving his own father who had had a massive stroke in um, the, the, the core of the brain. Uh, and it, it was only after an autopsy that they figured out just how miraculous it was that he was able to recover the ability to speak and walk after this, this stroke, because the stroke had occurred in the brain stem which, if you're a doctor, you know if a stroke occurs in the brain stem, more than likely you're going to die. He didn't die. He had a son that said, Dad, we're going to rewire your brain, and we're going to, we're going to get new pathways going forward. He, his breakthrough was a patient who had lost her inner ear and therefore her sense of balance. Uh, she, I, I, sh I should correct that. It wasn't a loss of the inner ear, it was a loss of the sensations from the inner ear responsible for balance. And so she couldn't keep herself balanced, which that's how you walk, that's how you navigate. If you don't have it, life gets really hard. So he said, if the neurons in the brain are plastic, I can teach another organ in your body about balance and you can regain balance. So he created a sensor that he would put on her tongue and the sensor would tell the tongue when she was going this way and when she was going that way and when she was going this way and back. And with the sensor's help, her tongue now became her inner ear and it rewired. And they thought, well, she's going to have to walk around with this sensor on her tongue, and that will tell her what, what to do. And it was a series of impulses that if you turn this way, the left side of your tongue got more weight. You know, you know how it works. It, it, it would just weight the tongue. They found that after they took the sensor off, she still had balance because her tongue had been rewired. He gave a uh, illustration of it that Suppose you wanted to go to Milwaukee. I don't know why you'd want to go to Milwaukee, but I suppose you want to go to Milwaukee and the major bridge is out. Uh, you would find a side street and try to drive into Milwaukee on the side street. Uh, these days, you would pull out your smartphone and cl click on Waze and Waze would talk you through it. Um, but the, the idea is if the main thoroughfare of of impulses in your brain is blocked, that the brain will automatically try to find a way around if you just give it the opportunity. You just have to present the opportunity that here's another way you can do it and accomplish the same thing. Uh, there's some pretty incredible things coming out of his research now, including uh, cameras that will um, uh, provide feeling to the back of blind people so that they'll be able to see objects in front of them. Uh, you know, some pretty incredible things. Um, you know, they're working on binocular vision fi fixing that. I've already mentioned stroke. Uh, it's being used for dementia, how to rewire around affected areas in the brain. Cortical implants is a new one. They just had a breakthrough this week with uh, uh, spinal cord injury, um, where they actually got men to walk again. Uh, they were suspended, but they got movement back in their legs because they, they routed electrons around the injured area through um, cortical implants, phantom limbs, chronic pain. Pretty incredible stuff. Isn't it amazing Jesus knew all of this? 
And so when he commands us to change our thinking, he's saying, I already know you. I already know what's created in you. I already know you have this incredible ability to rewire what you think. What we're finding is that experience actually changes the brain's physical structure and its functional organization. So you, you are building, the Bible talks line upon line, precept upon precept. You're, you're literally building new pathways, new thought patterns. There's a negative side of this, and that's negative plasticity, where you can train yourself to be an addict. So that's what happens. That's what happens with porn, drugs, and alcohol is that you literally hardwire a superhighway to pleasure centers in the brain and you get so addicted to that stimulus that you'd rather live under a bridge than get, not live without, would live without that drug. Um, it, it so overtakes your thought process that it's very hard for you to ever get free from that. Uh, studies now on porn are showing we've, we've unleashed a horror on a whole generation where we're training them into sexual dysfunction uh, because of the stimulus of porn. So there's a bad side to this. You can train yourself to be bad. And, and the more you repeat a particular pattern of behavior, the more you are predisposed to do that pattern of behavior. Jesus knew about this. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. It literally takes over your thought process. If you've ever done work with alcoholics, drug addicts, you, you know this phrase, stinking thinking, that literally their very thoughts are bad. What is generating that thought is addiction. It's not rational behavior. It's not healthy behavior. It is behavior that enables them to use again and use again and use again. Um, that is why Jesus says you become a slave to it. And the question from Jeremiah, can an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? And this is a prophecy over Israel and Judah. May you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Can you change? If you're so accustomed to doing evil, can you change? Can you change what you do? Lest you think you're immune to this, <laughs> I will put temptation before you. And if you're like me, you know the phenomenon of an ice cream container stuck deep in your freezer that is somehow able to talk to you. and to convince you from far away how good it would be to open that container and indulge yourself. Wouldn't that be good? I lived in Asia for a while, and it was amazing to me to find in, that, in, in cultures there that they don't have a concept of sweet, sweet. Um, and if you give them something sweet, sweet, they will actually turn from it the highest they get is fruit. And so to have something with a lot of sugar in it, their natural reaction is yuck. Uh, so you have to be trained to think that this is good. <laughs> and we have a whole food industry that has trained you quite well uh, for profit motive uh, to convince you that this is good. And we all know now from scientific studies that refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, all of those things that are in our food, uh, create chemical pathways in the brain that stimulate pleasure centers and create cravings. Not to make you feel guilty or anything. <laughs> but you understand how bad it can get and why people get caught in behavior patterns that are extraordinarily negative. Uh, and they don't realize because they don't realize their thoughts are so entrapped in that behavior pattern they can't get free. Uh, James sets up the, the, the way we get tempted and he's quite clear it's our own desires that do this and then we get enticed and then when that desire is conceived it gives birth to sin and then sin full blown turns into death. 
The good news is we have the mind of Christ, and that English word mind is the Greek word nous. So Paul is saying after our conversion, Jesus comes and freely gives us his mind, where we, can, we, we change, we are generated from within. Unless a man be born again, the Greek there is sui generis, regenerated from your innermost being, you cannot see the kingdom of God. But when you are, you get the ability to see, you get the ability to hear, and you get to think like Jesus thought, which for me is staggering, um, that we actually get his thought patterns. Uh, we we know, don't just know his acts, we know his ways. We know how he thinks. Um, and whenever I get into difficulty, I always go back to that wonderful time on the Godavari River, and I find my answer there because he is the answer. When, when my thought processes get negative, I go back to him, the positive, and it gets renewed. I have his mind. Um, okay, I'm trying to time myself here. I'm good? I'm worried about the time because I want to activate. <laughs> I want to get to the good part. Um, I've studied the 13th chapter of Matthew um, for over 20 years, and within it, I find a lot of keys to healing. I also find a lot of keys to evangelism, and you know why seed germinates in some areas and, and why it doesn't, um, and there the soil types of you know the pathway: rocky soil, thorny soil, and then good soil. Um, and I, I don't want to go into each one of those, but um, there's a lot to learn from that parable about how you can be speaking and one section has their arms folded and are resistant and another section has their arms raised and is receiving. It, it, it all has to do with their soil. Uh, and the revelation to me, and it's an amazing one, is that we get to tend our soil. And it's all back to that gift and task that we get to keep our own garden with the Lord. We get to make sure what seed gets planted in it. We get to weed it. We, we, we get to get rid of the thorns. We get to have good soil. We get to have root in us. We get to develop all of that. Um, but in the middle of all of this, um, the disciples come to... Jesus, first he congratulates them and says to you, you get, you get the secrets, you get the mysteries, to you the kingdom of heaven has been revealed. And he starts talking about prophets and kings who desired to see it, weren't able to see it, but they get to see it. And then they say, well, why do you teach in parables? Why, why don't you announce it plainly? And he responds with the Isaiah prophecy. The original prophecy is from Isaiah 6, chapter 10. It's the message that Isaiah has given to Israel. And uh, here Jesus makes it universal. And, um, and I'll just say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Um, and again, we have that turning, the metanus, the changing of your, your thoughts, the, the turning lest they should turn so that I should heal them. And this is the key to miracles, is you have open eyes, you have open ears, you have a heart of understanding, and you turn and you're able to see Jesus for who he is. You're, you're, you're not thinking anymore he's far away or that he's the angry God. 
You're not thinking you haven't done enough to please him. You're, you're not thinking about all the things that lead us into a hard heart. You're open, you're receptive, and you're able to see he has nothing against you. The only thing he has towards you is love. And he wants to set you free. Metanus, change your thinking and believe the good news. I got more on that, but I'm going to move on. <laughs> I want to talk about how do you believe the good news. Because um, a lot of people uh, get hung up on faith. Um, and there's a whole doctrine on this. Um, that can sometimes weigh people down, uh, particularly if you're sick and you're in pain and you start thinking, I don't have faith enough. And it could really quickly turn into self-condemnation. And oftentimes the church hasn't been all that helpful to you. Um, and it, it's, I, I try to make it simple. And um, I've seen some pretty incredible things, and, and you know, people want to try to tell me, oh, you must have great faith. And I go, no, I don't. I know some really great facts. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's definitely not me. If you knew me, you know that God wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. But the good news is he does, and he loves me, and it's great. I know some great facts, and the great fact is God had a plan. He had a dream in the Garden of Eden that you and I would dwell with him and be safe and secure, and he would provide all our needs, and he would come down in the cool of the evening and speak to us face to face. That's his dream. That's his desire. That's what he wants. That's pretty much it. We messed it up. And we believed a serpent who said, did God say, which is a very subtle way to introduce doubt, did God say. And uh, we got into the knowledge of good and evil. And with that knowledge, we have beaten ourselves and beaten ourselves and judged ourselves that God, a holy and righteous God, will have nothing to do with us. The good news is God hasn't given up on his dreams. And he created a wonderful plan to send Jesus to pay the penalty to take care of all of that. All of it. He has poured out his wrath on his own son. He's poured it all out. There's none that remains. Every single sin, every single disease was poured out on Jesus on the cross. All of it. There is none that remains. None. All we have to do, the key. You know, this is the disciples again coming to Jesus. I love their questions because they're good questions. You know, this is the crowd actually, not the disciples. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? What do we do? We're seeing you do it. You know, you look like a man to us. How do we do it? And he says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Faith is simple. It's believing that Jesus will do what he said he would do. It's nothing more. Don't make it something more, because it's not. I love the tingles. I love the presence. But the word is above all of that. He is above all of that. I have seen people here who didn't feel a thing. And they didn't believe it when a doctor told them, you're healed. I can't figure that one out. Uh, I've seen people healed that weren't even praying. I've seen people healed who didn't know they were being prayed for. You know, don't make it complicated. Be very simple with it. Jesus does what he says he'll do. Not only that, he did what he said he did. 
and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. We do. And we need to change our thinking and reorient it so that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we may know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. It all happens, and it's that gift and the task, that it's the gift of new life, conversion, rebirth, sugenaris. It's that you change your thinking and you believe and you believe in what he did. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, change your thinking, and believe the good news. Now, on Thursday morning, I was in a rather obscure book called The Philokalia. And uh, I was raised Baptist, and Baptists don't read The Philokalia. Um, and for those of you that don't know the Philo Carrier, God bless you. You don't need to know. Uh, but I really like the old writings, particularly of uh, the people who all they had was a desire for God and to know him intimately. And I get great inspiration. I used to do it secretly and not talk about it until Heidi Baker told me she did it too. And I figure here it's a safe place to let people know I'm reading the file of Kaylee. She's even changed the Jesus prayer. I don't know if you know the Jesus prayer. It's a meditative prayer. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And she's changed it to Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on your beloved. Which is a nice change. So, so go Heidi. Uh, and uh, if you ever do read that wonderful Greek text, next time you see Heidi and it looks like she's out of her mind, uh, she's actually quoting uh, from that text. Uh, it's, it's a way for intimacy with the Lord uh, that I find truly outstanding. They gave me a new interpretation on Metanous. Um, and in, in the these Greek writings, the noose is not only your innermost being, not only what in English we would call the soul, but they called it the eye of the soul. That it's what you look with, and it's how you perceive the reality of, around you. Um, and, and how much of our thinking, our, our, our basic perception is shaped by the externals, uh, whether it was how you were raised or what you were taught at school or your experiences in life, your disappointments, your mistakes, those, how has it shaped that inner perception so that you no longer see with your eyes, you no longer hear with your ears, you no longer apprehend with the eye of your soul the greatness of his power that you're constantly limiting God because of your prior experience in a lost and hurting world. It could have been how you were parented, uh, and I would urge you to get reparented. You've got a Heavenly Father who can train you up in the way you should go. You have the ability to change your thinking. But that Thursday morning, uh, and the word I have for you, um, John's going to ask you to speak. Uh, the, the revelation that was coming at that point was literally with my soul, I can see. And I can apprehend things spiritually that my natural eyes, my natural ears can't app apprehend. Now, I've known this from experience in hearing the voice of God. But Thursday, I got the revelation. I get to change what that eye of my soul looks at. I get to direct it. And so it's both the gift that it's been renewed, the gift that those who are born again get to see into the kingdom of heaven. 
but how often do I take the eye of my soul and I look at the really bad stuff instead of looking at the really good stuff? And with my heart, with my innermost being, I'm meditating on bad stuff. And whether it's past hurts or, oh no, the future's gonna be bad, or you, you just start naming the things that you're chewing on in that innermost being, and you're, and you're literally visualizing things that are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and boy, did I have a time of repentance. <laughs> Thursday morning, I need to change. And the great news is I have the power to do that. I don't have to think about that. Start thinking of the things that you don't have any control over. And there are a lot of them. You don't have any control over the family you're born into. None at all. You don't have any control of the language you learned as a child. None at all. You, 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 most of us don't have any control over our education. Um, you, know, you, start, you start down that list, you know, social status, all of those things. But the great news is you can control your thoughts today and you can focus the eye of your soul on the things that are eternal and on the promises of God. And the wonderful thing that happens is that when you do that, then the promises get real for you. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. And through that look, through that perception of him with your soul, faith gets released and gets appropriated. And instead of it being impossible, instead of it being negative, it now becomes very possible because the king of the whole universe is on your side and wants you to succeed. That is our task as believers. What are we focused on? And I've noticed with me in, in praying for healing, sometimes I can get really focused on the symptoms. And boy, when you're in a hospital room and, the, and those machines are going, oh man, um, it's hard. Uh, and I'm not gonna say, and sometimes it's, it's gonna be easy. Uh, but just start thinking right now, what, do you, what, do you, what were you meditating on this morning? Were you meditating on the greatness of God? You know, for, for me, I, I came to the realization Thursday morning that yes, in praise and worship, you betcha. Yes, when I'm reading the Bible, particularly reading the Psalms, yeah, I'm focused in on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I close that book and I put it away and suddenly I start to focus on my problem and your whole mood changes, your whole being changes, because uh, you lose that focus, you lose the awareness that in him we live and move and have our being. And how much I could live a more victorious life if I just changed what I was looking at with my heart, with my soul. And instead of contemplating the bad thing, start contemplating what good thing can God do today? Amen? Amen. Is it clear? Yes. Uh, is it easy? <laughs> I want a yes. It's easy. Why is it easy? Because Jesus will enable you. Jesus didn't ask me to come and speak this to you if he was going to be a hard word. It was going to be easy for you. And uh, I actually started rejoicing Thursday morning. I was like, you know, Lord, you've given me a short por porch to launch this message on because <laughs> I know they'll receive it. They'll, they'll understand it. And you've had so many spiritual experiences that it, you, it, I'm just giving you a language to describe what you've already done that the eye of your soul that is so open in praise and worship and was so open this morning that I literally heard angels singing with you, that that channel, if you will, that you individually were bringing from the throne room to earth, thy kingdom come, happen. Now the issue is, can it happen all the time? not just in praise and worship, 
not just in the miracle healing service when the atmosphere is just right and everybody has the tingle, but can it happen all the time where you can change your thinking, you can focus your heart's attention on him, believe the good news, and then have the kingdom come down and miracles be done. All right? I'm going to appoint a volunteer. Cassie, could you come up with your daughter? We're going to see if this works. Your daughter doesn't want to come. I can tell she's got her hands over her face and it's like, no, don't make him. Can I get a, another mic? You want to do this? All right, that's good, all right. Can you ask God who he wants to heal today? Make it easy, what, what does he want to heal? Where he'll give you the disease he wants to heal, and then you call it out, and you just have to focus on him, and it's all his idea. Jesus said, I see the Father work and I work. And it makes it really easy. And you've gotten it already. Um, I believe the Lord wants to heal a man, um, an, an older man of a stomach. I, it, people don't have ulcers anymore, but it's similar to like an ulcer. It's a, um, I haven't got a picture of something like on the side of your stomach, maybe. Does that describe anybody here? We're not trying to embarrass you. Any older? We got one. All right. Yeah, I want him to come in front. You look scared, you okay? You sure? <laughs> Greater is he who's in you. Uh, what's, what's wrong? What she described. You've got a growth on your stomach. <laughs> Isn't God cool? I mean, this is cool. Okay, you got the word, but you are gonna pray with power and authority are, are you in pain now? A little bit. Okay. You ready? You don't want to pray anymore. Okay. All right. You don't have to use the mic. We will secretly, secretly record you. God wants to give you back your joy. Yeah. You ready to do that? You did good so far. Don't, it's okay. Pray for, pray for joy. God, God brings joy. Right? I see a smile. 
I see teeth. Yay. So why are you crying? It's so good you're crying. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. You ready to do it again? All right. Do it again. Actually, I feel like there's a young woman here who is battling depression and maybe even um, some really having a hard time with her thoughts about living. Again, we're not trying to embarrass anybody, but if you want to get prayed for, yeah, we would love to pray for you. All right, go get them. Right now, all depression go in Jesus' name. Lift off in Jesus' name. God wants you to know that he's able to bind up all those wounds, all that hurt. And that, Lord, I just ask the balm of Gilead would just, just come over her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Just be with her. Now just drench her in your love, Lord God. Let her know that today is a new day. Behold, all things, all, all the former things, they've all passed away. And newness of life has come to you today. He's able to make all things new. Now we break this over you. We break the memory of it over you. In Jesus' name, be free. Free. For who the sun sets free is free indeed. Bless her, Father. Bless her. Amen. Here, bro. I get a smile too, yay. yay. You wanna try this? Are you serious? Yeah, I wouldn't ask if I wasn't serious. She's looking at me like, you're a crazy guy. <laughs> what? You're trying to recover? Well, Jesus does, he takes a long time. So. How should you do it? Do you know how to pray? Okay. When you pray, can Jesus answer that prayer? 
You would think so. Yeah. Yeah, you would think so. Uh, so pray, Jesus, who do you want to help today? No, no, you're, you're anti-microphone too? Okay. All right, you do that and you tell me and then I'll say, how about that? All right, no cameras either. We'll pretend they're all switched off. <laughs> and you're all alone in your prayer closet. <laughs> you got it already. Yeah. You see a little girl? Six or seven years old. Or seven years old. Has a dysfunction problem? With school? Is anybody here? Difficulty learning? <coughs> nope. Are the parents here? The kids are upstairs. Okay. Um, well, is there any parent here with a kid that's upstairs? Take her upstairs to the kids? All right. Hallelujah. Want to do one more? but he's having a hard time lifting his arm above his head or with strength. There's got one, one. Come on up. Gentleman. All right. All right. Pray that he gets here walking up. You can do that. All right. Now command the arm to move. Could you do that before? You could get almost there? Can you get even higher? If that's a rotator cuff injury, it looks, wow. Could you do that before? You wanna lean against the wall. Okay, we got a wall. Go lean against the wall. Can you lean against that one? Or? He's got cool. You asked to heal, for him to get healed walking up, and what happened? You, oh, you're not convinced. You're not convinced. You convinced now? Could you do that before? Not that hot. All right, you're not happy, you're not satisfied. Why? She just did this to me, like, no. Nah. You wanna go all the way around? Don't be shy, I mean, it's, you're in the throne room of grace. You get to boldly ask. No? Okay. 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 Now, can God heal him over there if you pray here? Well, that's where the wall is, so. If you pray here, can God heal him over there? All right, pray here and ask, if you ask anything in my name, anything in my name, that's the promise. So pray. Amen. All right, can you go around?
You got any pain? Still some pain? All right, ask the pain go away. Wow, I felt that. How's the pain now? Uh, you haven't done that in a while, have you? Go back to the wall. <laughs> What's the update on the girl? So our Brazilian girl that just went up with stairs with me, as soon as we got in the room, she said, that's the girl. So she saw the girl from the back. Um, I mentioned to the guy who's leading the kids' church that this lady had a word. She went up, gave the word, and that very girl put her hand up. So. Yay, God. There's one more? There's a little. I think there's a lot more. <laughs> there's a little girl here, and she has a eye thing right like that. I want that here. What's an eye thing right like that? A sky? It's oh. been there too long. OK. Would that be you? <laughs> if your daughter prays for you, will Jesus heal you? Yes. What do you think? All right, while they're praying, you guys want to try this? Uh, we had a hand raise earlier about people who are sick here. Can you raise your hands if you need healing? Okay. Now, the people around you seeing those hands, all I want you to do is focus on heaven with the eyes of your understanding and just get up and lay hands on them. And let's see miracles today because God wants to break through. He wants to give you the breakthrough so that miracles can be a common day experience in the church. That every time we gather together, we get to focus the eyes of our understanding on the greatness of his power and appropriate and command that to be done. His will be done on earth and in these bodies in Jesus' name. So gather around them, lay hands. Don't let anybody be without hands on them. The Bible says if any of you are sick, let them call for the elders, and we're gonna open that up to anybody. And let them lay hands, and the prayer of faith will raise them up. And so let's pray over them now. In Jesus' name, kingdom of God come, will of God be done in these bodies now. In all disease and infirmity, leave them. All pain be gone, and from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, let them be cleansed from all hurt, all disease, all infirmity in Jesus' name. Father, we receive it now from you. Open the eyes of our understanding. Open our ears that we can hear, our eyes that we can see. The greatness of your power, we receive it from you now. In Jesus' name. Now, what you couldn't do before... Start doing it now. If you couldn't move your neck without pain, move it. Couldn't move your arm without pain, move it. Begin to just do what you couldn't do before. If you couldn't see, open your eyes. If you got problems with one eye, close, close the good eye and look through the bad eye and just receive it. And if you still have a twinge, say, keep praying. We believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that gets an answer.
So, Father, we just come to you now. We ask for a refreshing of your spirit. Breathe on us. Be in us. And I ask that you would seal this word in their hearts, that their thinking, the eye of their soul, would be turned to you, that they may know the greatness of your power. I ask it now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Wow. Wow, wasn't that glorious? Amen. Let's stand and give the Lord a clap and give Gordon a good clap and thank you, Jesus. You know, I, let's believe God that as we go out from this place that we're never going to be the same again, that there's a, a change out of that stinking thinking, right? We have the mind of Christ. So, Father, let there be transformation as we leave here. God, we're going we're gonna to come back renewed, transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, we're going to go out. We're going to see wherever we lay the soles of our feet. You give us that territory for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Father, we're not ever going to be the same again. There's transformation. There's release. There's healing. There's power in the blood. And we are your ambassadors. Why don't you tell your friend that before you go? You know, you're, you're an ambassador for Christ. You get to do the stuff. You get to release the kingdom wherever we go. Amen. Well, if you need prayer for something, go turn around and tell somebody to lay hands on you. Go get somebody around you to pray for you, to bless you, to declare the good news over you. And, you know, believe God. Get into this habit of repentance. We're going to change the way we think by the grace of God. Amen.